Welcome to the True Tone Lounge. I'm your host, Zach Childs, and today we are sitting down in the home studio of Jimmy Olander. Jimmy, of course, is the only guitar player that's ever been with Diamond Rio, and he is a big part of their hits. They're the what you hear that kind of lets you know that you're about to hear Diamond Rio. I was just uh, kind of reminded by this on the uh, on the radio. They announced that it was the 30th anniversary of y'all's debut single, which was Meet in the Middle, being released. And it was your first single and it went all the way to number one. And a big part of that song is your guitar intro. The fact that, you know, it it, it just leads it off in such a, a great way in which you know this is not anyone else. You know mm. this is not Brent Mason or any of the other guitar players out there. It's such a unique style. And then also the, you know, of course, the rest of the band. But... What a what a neat uh, anniversary to be uh, celebrating, and thank you for uh, letting us uh, invade your home. Yeah. Okay. Good. Yeah. <laughs> it's right off the bat, you're hitting me with thirty years ago. Thirty years ago. <laughs> thank <laughs> you, Zach. <laughs> well, made, Is this going to be this difficult the whole yes, time? It, you made me feel. It made me feel old too when it's thirty years ago. Thirty years ago. Yeah. yeah. Well, that you yeah. know what that was. That was a really cool time. I'm, you know, so my memory gets a little fuzzy from this morning and last week, but I remember all the firsts. Yeah, you know, and that was a, that was a, that was a good time, man. And and being in the studio and kind of learning to make records. I had done some sessions, but I was never. That was never really my trajectory. You yeah. know, I thought it was going to be, but I did a little bit of that, and I went, oh man, this. This is not, first of all, I, I, I wasn't ready for it. And it was not, not what I thought it was gonna be and not something that I really wanted to do. I yeah. wanted to be in a band um, to have, to play what I kind of, what I wanted to do and to do, you know, kind of try to generate a style or, or do something. And Diamond Rio and, and in the beginning when we were making those records, they were, my partners and Mike Clute, Tim Dubois, they were very, very generous with do something for us, do this. And so a lot of times when we would go into the studio, I would compose, I'm much more of a composed guitar player than I'm a, you know, I can jam and I can do all that stuff, but that's not my sweet spot. Yeah. Uh, coming up with parts is, is a thing that I do. And Meet in the Middle was, was a thing that, you know, we cut the basic track to that and I just, and I didn't have anything. And in the early days, I always played acoustic on stuff. And I always just, and so we'd go in and used to piss Brian the drummer off because he's like, hey dude, I'm playing the real thing. I'm actually playing my parts here. I know you're gonna come back and lick all this stuff over. I need you to dig in and you know do your thing because he had nothing to play with. Right. So if you remember the intro to that, it was just and guitar because I was like, because in the track session, that was it. And I was like, man, I'm going to go home and I'll figure something out. I'll come back in here. We'll overdub this. And, uh, and they gave me a lot of, I don't know, latitude or they just, you know, let me do whatever I, I wanted to. And uh, it was great being in the studio at that time, too. That was, uh, I knew we were doing this interview. And I couldn't remember what I played through. 
because I know I only played through an amp, an actual physical amp, for one track on that first record. I played through my old uh, Fender Pro for Nowhere Bound, but everything else were, was through all this kooky old um, stuff that Mike Clute had gotten out of a radio station in Minnesota. Okay. And so he said that it was a stay level limiting amplifier. I think he bought for five bucks. And it was basically, you know, a broadcast limiter. And that was the, the preamp and that was the thing. And Meet in the Middle was a direct guitar sound through that old, you know, it's probably about this big with the, you know, big yeah. knobs and stuff like that. And I was, it was great. Because, <laughs> you know, getting a sound in the studio is like at least half of the battle, if not more. Yeah. And so for me to actually go in with my guitar and scope, all right, I'm not going to, I'm not, yeah, Here, here's my chord. What's yeah. it going to sound like? You and, know? and so you all created this. And... And direct was kind of the norm at that point also. It was. It was. You know, I had some old Mo West stuff. Are you familiar with yes. Mo? Yeah. Had some of the Mo West stuff. And, and I think Reggie was doing And direct was, was a thing. Yeah. You know, and I thought it was, I thought it was pretty sexy, yeah. you know, but uh, not dealing with microphones and, you know, what, a, what sounds to a, good to a guitar player standing three of feet above his speaker, yeah. you know, doesn't necessarily mic the same and stuff like that. So... You know, slowly but surely over the course, as you say, the last 30 years, I've gotten some of those chops together. <laughs> well, let's go back even further. Oh, let's, let's, great. Let's, let's make it painful. Let's do that, Zach. So just give us a snapshot of, you know, of, of your childhood and, and growing up in Detroit. Oh, okay. Yeah, and, and get us up to like, you know, uh, playing the banjo. Okay. Well, <clears throat> so I, I went to, we moved to Detroit from around the San Francisco, San Jose area of California uh, to go to sixth grade. And I, when we we're still out in California, I had found a mahogany uh, baritone ukulele or tenor guitar yeah. in, in my dad's closet. And he had, he had been taken from, they'd lived in, I was born in Minnesota and my folks are both from Minnesota. And there was a tenor banjo guy up there in, named Bill Peer, and he had taught my dad some how to stuff. And the music that he had had is what I discovered. And it was a sheet of music and it had full fingerboards. You know, when you see a fingerboard diagram, it's usually about five frets or something like that. Right. Well, these were full tenor banjo necks like this. And this is how you read the music. So it was all roaring 20s, five foot two eyes of blue and all mm -hmm. these other things. And so it'd have and it was all chord melody. And so there would be a chord melody thing and there would be like two and one, one and a half. And that's how many beats you played that chord for. And that's how right. you read what he was teaching the old man. So I was banging around on some of these things and, and my dad was like, man, I don't know why he thought that this was an incentive to me, but, but for some reason at work, he says, man, if you learn a couple of these songs, I'll get you a banjo. And I was like, all right, I mean, I wasn't a banjo lover. I was just, it was just one of those things. That was the carrot. So, you're, so you're, you're, you didn't want a banjo. Your dad just says, I'll buy you a banjo. And so why did your dad even think of a banjo? Well, I think it's because Bill Peer okay. played banjo. Okay. And dad, I guess, had a tenor guitar or something and learned on that. And so banjo seemed more than to him. Right. But however, it worked in the Olander blood that, you know, he told me banjo and I went, oh, yeah. Great, what a great thing. So I played tenor banjo moving to the Detroit area, and then um, we couldn't find any tenor banjo teachers. Eventually, I stumbled into Banjos of Michigan, which was, um, if you could imagine, 30 banjos in a room, everybody in straw hats, whack, whack, and whack, whack. There was a melody section yeah. and a chord section, and a guy had a big facade bass banjo, and we would yeah. play these little. Sounds like a cult. <laughs> it was what was interesting for me as I eventually became a bluegrass banjo player where, you know, the Gibson master tone right. and pre-war master tones and yeah. all that stuff ruled. Well, not in the tenor world. It's all bacon and day and yeah. um, all these other Vegas and all these other things and just super, super gaudy. Yeah. Wild banjos. And, and, they, and there were a few master tones. There was a lot of pre-war master tones, but those were definitely the stepchildren. They were sitting in the rear if you had a Gibson, you yeah. know. So, um, but anyway, we couldn't find the teacher at the time. And my dad, he got me 
five string banjo lessons from Maggie Taylor up in, at a little hippy dippy music store up in Detroit. Yeah. So, but there's a huge difference between playing tenor banjo and playing five string. Completely different techniques. The repertoire, a, yeah, tuning, everything, everything. The style is, of music that you play on it. Yeah, everything's, yeah. everything's way different. Um, and I, but I fell in love with it. Now, you know, I think like a lot of, a lot of pros that you'll talk to when they started playing, they were five, eight hours a day, every day, playing yeah. constantly. Yeah. And that's what I was doing there. So I think I started when, when I was 11, maybe 10 or 11, and I, and I took for about six months, and then I took off six months, and I was just studying and just getting everything I could get in out of the banjo. And then I went back to work at that music store, Strings and Things, and took over the intermediate and advanced students. She taught the beginners. And just before I turned 13, so I was 12, I remember the old man had to take me in. It was, you know, the kid goes for his first job. Yeah. You know, made me, oh, I don't want to talk to Lieb. He, Lieb was the owner of the store. You know, he says, dude, you're going to have to, this is your job. This is my job. Yeah. I'm going to be taking you there because you can't drive, you know, but you're going to have to go in there. And th they were hippies, and I heard words like, I'm not an ageist. I will hire this young man, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and so, so my, uh, my development was consumed with bluegrass and alternate bluegrass because, you know, I, I, I was a Scruggs guy for a long time. And through my development, I heard, you know, these other players, Alan Monday, probably my favorite banjo player that, and, and at that time, you know, Bobby Thompson, Tony Trishka, Bill Keith, any of the other guys that were doing the more melodic and more progressive stuff. Yeah. Um, and Detroit actually was had a really good um, bunch of bluegrass up there because when the South was depressed and the auto industry was super strong in the Detroit area, there's a lot of people that moved from the South to come up, left their sweeties back, back home and make some money and come back down and just life caught up with them and they were locked into mortgages and car payments and they never made it back home. And uh, so there's all these transplanted hillbillies up in Detroit, and it's a hotbed of bluegrass music. When I moved to wow. Nashville, I was like, man, I'm gonna go to Nashville. This is gonna be really, really cool. Man, I've been waiting to get around all the bluegrass. It was super backward and super traditional. And if you didn't hold your hand like Earl and play everything, or don't play any of that devil melodic banjo, you know? Yeah. It was, it was really kind of had that classic Bluegrass prejudice, you know, yeah. no electric instruments, no progressive stuff, yeah. So what year is this that you moved to Nashville? I moved in 79. Right. And, and you moved as a banjo player. I moved as a banjo player and um, to make my, my fortune. Yeah. Zach, nobody cared. <laughs> nobody cared. <laughs> yeah, seriously. And I was like, oh man, I spent all this time. And, yeah. and you know what? I was actually, so as a kid, you know, I was, I was, the kind of unusual looking little, you know, okay, here's a, here's a little bitty kid that can really play, yeah. you know, and that was, that was kind of charming and stuff. When I got here, you know, as a college student, I moved, come down to Belmont and looking for, looking for banjo stuff and didn't do, do much down here. I played a little bit with Randall Hilton. I don't know how bluegrass you are, but Randall was a, was a, if, you know, there's only a few bluegrass songwriter guys back then. There, Pete Goble and then Randall Hilton got lots of cuts with a lot of my favorite things. And I played with with Randall. I remember waking up early um, in the mornings to go do the Carl Tipton show. You know, with, yeah, morning with, show. Yeah, yeah, the early morning show, banjos at 5 a.m. This is a tough. Is a, is a wake up call for sure. <laughs> that will wake you up, and yeah. nothing else will. Yeah, and and moved down here and went to went to Belmont and, you know. The, the banjo just kind of went the way of the dodo. Yeah. So. so, so you moved to Nashville as a banjo player, but you but you also moved to go to Belmont. Correct? I went to yeah to come to Belmont. Okay, and so you start going to Belmont, and and so when does it start hitting you that that the banjo is not the way to go, and you need to find another instrument to play? Uh, okay, so I was um, so I had these banjo chops. You know, I don't necessarily anymore. Um, that, that I've actually got some back because yeah. uh, COVID had. A bunch of my ultra tr marathon pals, somehow between garage sales and Facebook Marketplace, there are seven banjos amongst our trail runners, and I'm yes. teaching them all to play banjo. So yes. I actually have to know what I'm doing. So, um, but I, I moved moved to Belmont, and I was there was a steel player um, named Terry Went, and he was a real hot licks steel player, 
And Eric Silver was a friend of mine that I had met out at Opryland because I went and worked in the park my first year. Yeah. Um, and Eric Silver, and he was kind of, man, Eric's just a fantastic musician, player, mandolin, fiddle, all the bluegrass stuff. And so we would jam and I would just play my banjo with this. And, and finally, I'm, after about, I think it was two years, two and a half years, I was going to Belmont. And so as I was working as a kid, I made this, you know, I was living at home, no, no expenses other than buying instruments. I had a fortune and I was paying my way through Belmont, you know, just writing the check myself. You know, the folks weren't paying for it. There were no scholarships. Wow. I didn't do well enough yeah. in high school to get scholarships, nor did I know that I had anything for Belmont to offer. Uh, so, and he goes, hey man, why don't you get a guitar and we'll go out and we'll, we'll play. And so, you know, if you're learning banjo and you're, you know, originally learning banjo transcribing from vinyl, you know, when the needle hits, you get some pretty good chops with picking things up quickly. Yeah, and because those notes are flying by. The even notes if you, are flying by. if you slow the record down. Yeah. Well, I, I didn't have that. Yeah. I yeah. didn't have the, 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 the slow the neck record down. Eventually, I got a cassette yeah. with where you could remember the old cassettes where you could punch yes. the numbers in and it would rewind to that spot and you know I could get yeah. it back. I remember just killing this, killing this live from Bean Blossom thing. I was trying to learn this Jack Hicks, Hicks lick and just just drove my mother out of the house, you know. So um, anyway, uh, he said he talked me into basically dropping out of college and going and hitting the road because I could learn. I had electric guitar and I would just learn these top 40 country things and we did like we went with a guy, this guy named Rudy somebody, I don't know, who was an older guy. It must have been a vanity project for him or something because yeah. he was way too old to be doing regional country gigs in Portsmouth, Ohio, and then, you know, Terre Haute, Indiana, and that type of stuff for a week yeah. at a club. Um, and now this is right around the time of Urban Cowboy, too. So, you know, they the country was hot. Yeah. You know, so... Um, he talked me into to dropping out of college, and I was it was it was interesting the transition from playing acoustic music to playing electric Telecaster was a daunting task because of just you know the I didn't know anything about the setup of the instrument and for sure the back pickup man that bridge pickup that was that was too much for me you know everything was was smooth on the neck pickup and occasionally I'd go to two pickups and man, if I was feeling really ballsy, I'd hit it on the bridge, but very seldomly just cause it's just like, oh. oh. Which, which seems funny because you're a ban you were a banjo player and it's like, it should have been where that high end and the, and the, the attack of it shouldn't have thrown you off that much, maybe. I, I, theoretically, that's yes. great. But the, the, that was but not, not the practice. practice. Yeah. The pra and I think, you know what, actually I think it has something to do with the immediacy of the note. Yeah. Okay, and the unforgiving nature of bridge pickup Telecasters. Yeah. Okay, and you know, I was playing through, what was I playing through? I might have been playing through, because I, my buddy, Terry, that had talked me into doing this, you know, I'd go out and jam at Jeff Newman. You remember Jeff Newman's yeah. pedal? Okay, you know, Terry was, was a teacher out there at Newman's thing. I would see all this stuff, and PV ruled Nashville. Yes. You know, during uh, what is now CRS, Country Radio Center, it used to be called DJ week, you mm -hmm. know, uh, and during uh, country music DJ week, PV would have the PV room. Yeah. And basically, if you walked through the door, they'd give you a session 400, you know what I mean? Just like, it, like grass seed, it was flying, this, this PV stuff. So I had like a session 400 and a Telecaster with a 15 in it. And it was just, I mean, that's, that's how I was trying to, trying to figure it out, you yeah. know, and it was, and it's somewhat ironic. So, and but I always liked the jazzier stuff. And when I was playing bluegrass, I was listening to more jazz stuff. There was a, a record that, what was his name? Slim Ritchie put out called Jazzgrass. And Alan Mundy, my favorite guy, yeah. uh, played on that record. And he played a big fat guitar. And so I was all about that neck pickup and wishing I was Leon Rhodes. However, I hadn't heard of Leon by yeah. that time, maybe Tiny Moore or something yeah. like that. So. This Telecaster that you have, is this is this a regular Telecaster? Or? Telecustom. Okay. Telecustom. So but this, you haven't met Joe nasty, yet. Nasty, te <clears throat> nasty Telecustom with that funky humbucker in there. And it was their version of a Gibson, I guess, with a single yeah. coil on the bridge and the knobs and the yeah. switch up here and stuff. Um, yeah, I hadn't met Joe yet. Yeah. Um, now I was still in, had I met Joe yet? 
because I, I don't remember I was still living on Belmont Boulevard close to campus when I met Joe. I remember he and April and I think Andy Reese or Mel Deal coming, coming by and uh, introducing me and I, I, I owned a pedal steel guitar. Yeah. But I was merely an owner of a pedal steel guitar. I could, I did a had the Winnie Winston book, and I could go. I did could do that stuff. But I loved steel guitar, so and that's when uh, Mel. I, no, that's was it. I, I made the connection through Mel Deal because we worked in that staff band at Opryland, and he introduced me to Joe. He says, "Man, you love steel. This guy's making these kooky string bender things. Do you know anything about this?" And and Dan Schaefer, buddy of mine, had come down and stayed with me at the dorm as he was moving to Nashville and trying to find a place. Uh, and he had brought the first string bender I'd ever seen. He had one of those Parsons white mechanisms. Yeah. In a, in a Telecaster at the time, he had, eventually took it out of there and mounted on the back of an SG and he had palm pedals with him. It's like super Frankenstein yeah. thing. So, uh, yeah. So anyway, that was, that was that. And that's when I, when I met Joe and kind of started doing that. So I really, you know, I mean, I had, had a Telecaster and I was playing bad guitar there for a little bit before Glazer hooked me up with a good guitar. Well, yeah. better than I had. Yeah. So at what point did you decide to, to drop the thumb pick and go to the, the flat pick? You know, I think I was playing with a flat pick on the Telecaster. Yeah. So why? I mean, you had already formulated a, a, a I'd never yeah. seen anybody play a guitar with with a flat with a thumb pick okay you know so you hadn't seen Chet or you hadn't seen those other I people. well I was I was aware of Chet I yeah. had Chet records yeah but I had never seen this wow yeah, <laughs> yeah. okay I yeah. had never yeah. seen this yeah and uh, guitar grab yeah. a pick exactly grab right? a flat pick yeah yeah and and also I came from bluegrass you know I mean I didn't just mess right. around with bluegrass yeah, you were hard. Nobody for plays with a thumb pick. Right, uh, acoustic players. Right. Yeah. None right. Of, yeah, they all use flat picks. Okay. Yeah, and that so. That makes sense. So, yeah, I, d I did that and, you know, met Glazer and he made that, that first Telecaster, which was, you know, had, had both benders in it, you know, which was, he was figuring it out and he had the mechanism. Actually, I think that, that mechanism may be in this guitar. Okay. From that first one, yeah, um, that may be an updated mechanism over here in this yellow telly. But um, he was just figuring that stuff out. So you know, there, I've always talked to a bunch of people to, to, to guys that go, "How come your G bender's up here and your B bender's down here? That's totally backwards." Yeah, and I was like, "Well, not when we were doing it. It wasn't backwards. Yeah, it's ergonomically correct." Right, because the, the G know. strings here and the B strings here. How about having the G lever here and the B string here, which meant that the down push was here and the out push was there. Um, I can see that there are so many more B bending guitars. You know, that's they use the word. You know, it's a yeah. bender guitar if you're a G player, right? But but they, everybody calls it a B bender because yeah. that's synonymous with what Albert was doing and what Clarence was doing and right. all the really cool stuff when it first was coming out. It was all B bender stuff with the Parsons White. So, but you know, we're like, well, third strings here, B strings there, do it like this. And that's that's the way I've always done it. It, it makes, yeah, it makes perfect sense. So you're, you're a banjo player, you start playing guitar and then you get this double bender guitar. And and so of course, from being banjo, you're already used to doing you know, your fingers. So are, are, were you were you using any any finger picks at this point at all with a flat pick? No. Or you, so you'd already no. So yeah. so I had when I was working at that music store, I had worked, I had goofed around with some with a thumb pick, and I think that that big red guild was my first guitar, and I tried to play that, but you know. To me, I, was, I wasn't skillful enough to get a good sound with metal finger picks on an acoustic guitar. Yeah. Just couldn't, yeah. so that was just a deal killer. Yeah. And I had, uh, I had, you know, pretty strong nails, and I was, I was a guy that drank the Knox drinking gelatin. Did you ever do that? To grow your nails? Oh, it's <laughs> no, nasty. No, it's nasty. That. Looks, yeah. you know, you have this orange flavor, and you mix it up, and it's, you know, I don't know if it's got, antelope hoofs in it, but it's supposed to make your nails really strong, man. I just, it looks like tang. It didn't taste like tang. I was like, oh, terrible. So I've now, well, now I'm fully acrylic. Yeah. Tell us how your style starts to develop because, you know, of course there's the temptation to 
imitate what everyone else is doing, which you have to do to a degree when you're playing when you're playing cover tunes. But when you start playing original tunes, you you kind of have the freedom of creating your own parts. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, tell us how that developed. Uh, well, I mean, you know, it's not just completely one track, right? I mean, there were I was hanging out with a steel player and uh, being buds with Joe. I had access back in the day. They used to make a lot of instrumental records, and yeah. steel players made them. Guitar players weren't really making records at the volume that steel players were making records. Yeah. I loved all that bendy stuff, and it was all country based, and it was all jazz. A lot of it was jazz influenced, or it was traditional country. It was all the stuff that pushed my buttons. Yeah. If it, it wasn't bluegrass, it had a jazz influence, or it was super super country, and I loved all that stuff. So. I was raiding these guys' record collections, had the double bender guitar. I can remember um, Paul Franklin had a record, one of his, might have been his first record, I can't remember. Seems like there was a, like a baseball motif uh, or something like that. And I had figured out one of Paul's songs verbatim with, with the, the because it was, it was a chicken picking him, do you a little, I, yeah. I couldn't even play it for you now, but. Um, and I had figured it out with the with the with the double banders, kind of kind of making that. And so I was kind of listening to other instruments and doing some of that stuff, and then raiding these le record collections. And uh, I think Danny Schaefer had played me uh, was it back at, back to Birmingham, an old Freddie Weller song. I might be getting the the title wrong. Um, that had some bender stuff on that. Yeah, but Freddie had a bender. He had a B bender. Is that yeah. what that was on yeah. that? It was. It seemed like it was one of the. Yeah. The butcher block ones, right? Yeah, one of the Evans pull strings. Yeah, had one of those. So uh, listening to that and listening to uh, probably my favorite cut of Clarence was "Ode to Billy Joe" and just yeah. great, great stuff. Yeah. Um, so yeah, and kind of started falling in love with that stuff. Now at the same time, um, there were some great Telecaster players around, and I was trying to, you know, I'd. I was out of college. I needed to make some money. I needed to play some guitar, and I'm nobody's going to pay me to hear me sing. So I had to get get something going, and so I was listening to a lot of the contemporary guitar players. And this is back when uh, I remember Great Escape. I don't know if they're still here, but the, yeah. they are they still here? Yeah, oh. but they're out on Charlotte now. Okay. Yeah. Well, when they were down on Twenty First Avenue, I'd go down to Great Escape, and it seems like they were all MCA records but it was all the promotional copies from the MCA vinyl. So they all had this big white thing and in the middle had that like bluish colored MCA thing. And all right, man, I'm gonna grab some, I don't know if these artists, but I remember I wanted to get stuff with Fred Newell on it and I was listening to Dale Sellers and I was listening to Pete Wade and Phil Ball and um, it was a while, but I hadn't discovered Reggie yet. And trying to, you know, trying to learn that that twangy stuff it wasn't a great time for. There was some good. There was some good telly stuff, but in general, that was a lot of Tom Collins production, where there's one single on an album, and it's "You Can Eat Crackers in My Bed," and it was just you know, it's a lot of. I was kind of having to weed through the chaff to find the yeah. find the good picking on there. Yeah. Then how do how do we get up to the kind of germination of the of, of Diamond Rio, which was then like the. Oh, oh, but okay, I, we did, we digress. Uh, okay. you, were, you were talking about style. Yeah. Right. And you, how did you do? The, yeah. Right. Wasn't that the, I kind of kind of got got off on backstory. Uh, so, at this time, I was also listening to Brent, because Brent was playing at the old Stagecoach. Right. Was it was it the old stagecoach? I can't remember if it was the stagecoach, but I know it was the it was the ground floor bar of the Red Eye Lion Inn on Murfreesboro Road. I think that was the original. One. Was was it called yeah. the stagecoach? Yeah. Okay. I can remember when they moved to that freestanding building, it was the stagecoach. But I would go down there and it was a great band. I think his name was David Bird played piano and Don K Kelly played bass. Yeah. Brant and then Paul Cook. And as a banjo player, you know, who had banjo on their records? Jerry Reed had banjo on, and I knew Paul Cook. He played on all that Reed stuff. And Paul could do more with a snare and a hi-hat and a kick drum than most guys can do with this massive kit. I mean, it's just great. And I was like, this is Paul Cook. He's just playing a bar, bar gig. And, I, you know, my perception of, you know, yeah. bad to the bone. And Brent, way back when, was Brent Mason. He's always played unbelievably well. 
And I could go and, you know, I don't think I even drank a beer at the time. I'd go and nurse a Diet Coke or something like that. And I could just sit in there and watch him play. And it was a stage was here and the club was really, really narrow. So you'd pretty much just sit right there at the foot of this guitar deity watching him play. And, you know, I finally got my the courage up to introduce myself when he'd moved over to the other stage coach. And I'm a guitar player, man. I really like what you're doing, blah, blah, blah. And I had my little Walkman cassette recorder with me. I said, it'd be all right if I, I taped your set. And Brent went, hey man, you want, you know, cause he knew, he knew why I was talking to him. Yeah. You know, he says, would you like me to take your, your, your cassette up there on stage? And he took my cassette and put it his, he had like a bandit or something like that on a chair and he put it right in front of his amp. And so it was like the more me Brent Mason cassettes. <laughs> it was just so generous and so, oh, he's made it so, yeah. So easy on me to yeah. ask, can, can you show me, basically, yeah. I want to learn what you're doing. Yeah. I'm going to put your little cassette recorder right in front of my amp so you can hear everything that I'm doing. Exactly. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. And it, and it was really cool. And I, and I cherished and I labored over those cassettes and, and stuff like that. So I'd been listening to some, some Brent Rowan. Yeah. Some Brent Mason, some Phil Ball. And so, so Joe had made my first guitar, you know, and he, was, he, he had been... Uh, he was very kind to me, you know, and he knew I was trying to get some stuff together and I was, you know, an awkward kid and whatever. And, and he, was, he was mentoring me and uh, I didn't ask him to do it, but that's just how our relationship went. Yeah. And um, so I would make recordings for him or I would go play. Um, I would go sit in, Joe and I would go, he had a gig at the Demon's Den on Gallatin Road, I think, and it was in or near Dickerson, Dickerson Road. And it was this really weird, weird club. It was a trucker, trucker bar, and all the trucker handles were written in neon, and so the black lights were all in there, and just it was this really, really bizarre thing. And I'd take my an amp and a guitar, and I'd just go in and like sit in as if I'm in the band for the rest of the night and try to figure out how to play. And he was just, he was playing steel, yeah. you know, kind of sneaky Pete Pete style with the ring finger and all that stuff on his right hand. So. Um, Anyway, he mentored me and he said, man, Jimmy, this is really good. You sound just like Brent Mason. You sound just like Brent Rowan. You sound just like Phil Ball. What do you sound like? Yeah. You know, he didn't say it with that bravado, but yeah. pretty close to verbatim what he said. At some point, I need to, I need to hear what you're doing, you know? And so um, I took that to heart. And I was like, how do I do that? You know, and I took, I'd listened and by this, uh, now I'd discovered Leon Rhodes, my favorite, you know, and some of the jazz influence and some of the other stuff and what I had in my background and my hip pocket from all this banjo technique and all these things. And I intentionally tried to come up with a style. Now, what is that? Is that harmonic structure? Yeah, that's part of it. Is it phrasing? Yeah. Is it a sound? And I've got these two pull strings on there. But, you know, the pull strings were, a, were definitely a part of it. But the other stuff, I think, also is a part of what, what that particular s style is. And uh, so I won't, I won't insult anybody with any false humility. I've got some things down, you know. Um, but I'm not the greatest guitar player in the world, but I have focused very much on this, which, which sometimes almost seems like a caricature. If I hear a bunch of tracks that I played on back to back to back to back, and I was like, Phew. there's that guy again. You know, it doesn't, it's not, there's not a lot of chameleon going on. Yeah. So it's a specific thing, and it's something that I intentionally did, and Every occasionally I wish, you know, I was maybe a little more rounded or something like that, but you know, so be it. Yeah. COVID's helped a little bit with that. <laughs> Playing some other stuff. Playing some other stuff. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah. There are several guitars back here that are really cool guitars. I had no idea what to do with them. Yeah. And I learned what to do, like, especially the Gretches, you know, I cut, I cut, uh, Diamond Rio had a hit on Beautiful Mess and I had borrowed a friend's guitar because I thought I wanted to be Dwayne Eddy. So it should sound like Dwayne Eddy on that thing. And I've got this, actually, that purple guitar right back here is not my guitar. It's been here for 
a long, long time, but both I and Marco realized that's his guitar. He just didn't need it back any. Yeah. And, but I bought this other green one. I was like, great, man, I got a, got a, got my own Gretsch. I can actually do this and still didn't know what to do with it other than, you know, yeah. so anyway, yeah. So how, you know, so you're, you're, you're sitting in with, with Glazer's, you know, you know, group that he's playing with some and like, are, are you making a living playing at this point or are you, are yes. you eating ramen noodles or what are you doing? Yes. Yes. To all that fish heads and rice yeah. three days. Yeah. Um, yeah. I was, I was geeking around and, yeah. and stuff like that. And I, you know, I don't know. I might've been playing with Mel McDaniel at, okay. the, at that time. Yeah. How did you get the gig playing with Mel? Because I mean, I, I'm guessing that was your first like big, big time gig, okay, right? So, so I really didn't know how to play guitar. You know, I had done this kind of regional club thing, yeah. but I didn't know how to play guitar uh, when I got the Mel gig. Um, Andy Reese was the guitar player on the gig, and Andy, you know, and Joe, you know, they're all my buddies, right? Yeah. Um, and I think. And I don't know how, after working with Mel and leaving Mel and remembering how the, what the fall, emotional fallout was that immediately, I can't imagine Mel taking Andy's recommendation on hiring me. It just, that's not how exiting employees, the relationship went with Mel. Right. I like Mel, but it, he was a little, you know, <laughs> you can't quit, you're fired. It's one of those. So, yeah. uh, so. Anyway, Andy was leaving the gig and maybe Glazer, and somehow I got the Mel gig. And I remember taking an amp up to his little place up in Hendersonville. And through transcription, we talked about with the banjo stuff, I could tra do the train monkey thing where hear a lick, play a lick, hear a lick, play a lick. And that's what, he, that's all he wanted. Right. He wanted his records repeated verbatim every night. Yeah. Every note specific. Yeah. Okay. Well, you don't have to know how to necessarily play to just repeat and copy this stuff. Yeah. To just ape what, what was done. And on the that's what I did. And I, I actually think maybe Andy didn't do this. Andy's like killer, killer guitar player. Yes. Probably too good of a guitar player for that gig to where he was having to dumb himself down to play these licks and yeah, stuff like that. You get down that. the fiddle and you get down the bow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, um, which was an interesting, all that stuff that I was learning were not Nashville productions, they were all Memphis productions. Really? From a band that was a standalone band called Shiloh that worked with, I forget his name, Rogers was his last name. Okay. I wanna say Frank, but we know that yeah, that's not, not right. Frank it's, uh, yeah. But anyway, it was Rogers was his last name. And yeah. He cut over in Memphis. Wow. And that that's was it. the band from Memphis. So uh, anyway, I got the Mel gig. And that's when I started really, you know, cause I had an artist gig, I was making money. It was a salaried gig. Um, and I was, I could repeat that stuff. And, and the fact that I was Mel's first guitar player that spit out the record parts just like they were, I was actually the greatest guitar player he'd ever heard in his life. I mean, you know, I was just like, wow, where have you been all my life? Yeah. I couldn't play Zach. Yeah. And so every day I would take my guitar, which was this, this massive big, blue anvil case. I didn't have a regular case. I just had this big travel case. I don't yeah. know why, but I would take that thing into the hotel room, second floor. I would drug that thing. All, and Mel just knew I was in working on his stuff. Yeah. You know, and he thought, what a dedicated, that Jimmy Olander, yeah. what a dedicated guy. I was in there trying to learn to play guitar. Yeah. You know, I had tapes and stuff and I would play all day long. And, and uh, you know, it was a really good gig to do that because there wasn't anything, any new challenges for me on that gig. Material, he didn't release records very often. And, yeah. you know, we did the play show. The, play the hits. Play, play the hits, hits and, yeah. and then we're done, you know. Yeah. Of course, this is back in the day when when artists would go out and maybe, maybe, it was, maybe it was the fact that he was in Oki and we played a lot in Oklahoma and some in, down in Texas. We played these big pole barns out there and and there would be a dance set that the band would play, and then Mel would come out for the show. Right. And then we do another dance set and another show. So, you know, it felt like a club gig, you yeah, know? Because you, you've just played for four hours plus sometimes. Yes, yes. Yeah. We actually, you know, the musicians were actually doing, you know, one set, then the 
set with Mel, and then another set, and then set with Mel, and stuff like that. So I don't, I never hear about dance sets anymore. Yeah. Thank goodness. So. Yeah, that's not not the norm. Yeah. yeah. So so anyway, that was my deal, and it was it was it was a really fun gig. You know, and some great musicians came through that band too. That's when I got to play. Well, I don't know if you're familiar with uh, P.T. Gazelle or Phil Gazelle. However, you might yeah. know. Just a, a stunning harmonica player, Henry Paul, because I played with Bruce Brown. We did twin guitars there for, for a little bit. Just, yeah, I had, had some good guys to, and guys that were actually gigging professional musicians, yeah. you know. And at the time, you've got, you've got this uh, Glazer Telly with the double bender on it by this I do. point. Yeah. Yes. yes, yes. And as I was telling you earlier, I, I, I would, I'll have to dig this up again, but I found Hee Haw footage of you playing with Mel, playing that to that uh, sunburst Glazer Telly with the benders on it. So and, I would and, love to see. You know, yeah, I'll, I'll I don't do remember doing Hee Haw with Mel. Yeah, I believe you. Yeah, um, I remember doing it with Rio. I don't remember doing doing Hee Haw with with Mel. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Cool. Yeah, I would I'll, like to see that. I'll dig. I'll dig it up again. Yeah. 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 yeah that's probably. That was probably. Um, we're post mullet. That was pre mullet. I'm sure. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It was pre mullet. Okay. I hadn't even yeah. heard of them yet. Now. Yes. It's gonna but make you, the big time. But you were thinking about. Oh, it. baby, we're gonna be stars, man. What are you talking about, Zach? So you also did some time do, doing some some session work because you you kind of you kind of got plugged in doing a little bit of session work also. I did. I did. Yeah. Um, interesting. You know, I uh, I did some sessions for friends. Um, and I did some masters. I didn't do any demos. You know, there's wow. usually, well, and so, I think maybe we had talked earlier about <clears throat> session playing and me not, you know, being ready. Well, it's because I had not got that craft together through playing demos. Demo, yeah. You know, the pr progression is, you know, you show up somebody's house with a little four track cassette and that's where you start and then you go, all of a sudden you're in a, in somebody's garage studio that's nicer yeah. than the bedroom, and then all of a sudden you're in a big studio. Well, I didn't have that progression coming through. You the just you went straight up to, to playing on masters, and I went straight to playing on masters because I had come up with the, and this this is my pal Joe too. Yeah, um, had he would get a call. You know, he's kind of ground zero for a lot, taking a lot of hey, what do you know about this? And he had turned me on to several of these things, and I went in to be. You know, it's kind of like Don Meredith and with Cassell or something, the color guy on the session. You know, here's the gimmick, the guy with the with the double benders, and this is going to be my the, our our signature thing. Yeah. And I had uh, even at that point, I was valuing signatures. I wanted to, you know, I wanted to do something meaningful for the songs that wasn't just playing along with the songs, but you know say something that contributed to it being memorable or something like that. Not, not to say that it was all just benevolent, you know, but this was what I was into too, you know. Yeah. This is kind of, hey, look at me, look at me. Yeah, because um, it's unique. Yeah, and yeah. I, that's what I wanted to do. And so it goes back to, my, the, to the session thing. I found out early on doing some sessions that, oh my goodness, being a journeyman in here with strangers at this session showing up strangers at this session i guess if you do enough of them you, you're in the community and and but i never i didn't spend enough time there to really and but i was doing these different sessions and i was like man it just felt a little bit unfulfilling to me some of the music i liked and some of the music i didn't like um now i say the masters some of these were custom records though i worked for robert metzger was working for robert and it was definitely the Hey, we're in from, we're in from Ohio, and we want to be stars. Well, That's meet right. me down at Choney's. That's right. And we'll talk about your deal. You know. Yeah. Um, <laughs> anyway, I was doing doing some of that stuff, and I learned that I, I actually really liked to play with my friends, and I liked to play, my first idea. I didn't like to play my first idea and some up somebody come out and go hey. I'm thinking maybe like a Brent Rowan vibe here, or maybe you can do this. And I'm thinking, you know, maybe you could hire Brent Rowan. Yeah. <laughs> maybe you, you know, yeah. I know Brent's going. Brent Rowan's going to do Brent Rowan a lot better than I'm going to do Brent Rowan. Yeah. You know, but I just played my best stuff. Yeah. It's only going to get worse from yeah. here. <laughs> yeah. Because, but you know, they can't afford Brent Rowan. 
Yes. Thank you, Zach. <laughs> Thank you, Zach. I was in the, I've been marked down that week. I was almost to expire. <laughs> But that, that, yeah, that's that's the unfair, you know, aspect of that where it's like, yeah, and, and I don't I don't get it at all. Why do why do producers right. why do producers okay. you know ask I, you, you know to what? play I like actually, somebody else? It's I ridiculous. I actually got the gig yeah. replacing Brent Rowan on some stuff. Yeah, and they actually wanted me to do what I did. So <laughs> <laughs> I re I remember I got I came into the Rick and Jan Janice Carnes. The Carnes. I don't know okay. if you're familiar with any of that stuff. This is something that Glazer set me up with, and they're actually dear friends of mine. Yeah. And they had Brent Rowan had played their stuff, and I listened to their stuff, and it was great. Yeah. So it's a little bit weird not having the experience of being a journeyman session player, and Brent had played on this stuff, and you know I'm I'm I've got a little imposter syndrome as I'm showing up at this session, going, geez, man, I don't I don't know what I'm doing like this guy. And they had replaced Brent Rowan on their next project with Ray Flack. Ooh, yeah, yeah. Ray's got that thing that I aspire to have where you know it's Ray Flack. Yeah. Immediately. Okay, you want me, me to do this. Yeah. Uh, but I think it was, it was a little bit of what I did and I think it was the fact that I was young and I listened to him too because Janice gave me this great piece of advice. She says, man, you know, we've had Brent, Brent Rowan, he's killer. Ray Flack was killer. But Rick and I, we spend all this time writing these songs and we craft this lyric. And with us, for our stuff, we're kind of writing these harmonies. And we're, we love the Everleys and we like this and we like Graham Parsons and we like what Emmy Lou did with them. And they were kind of on the art side of country music, but they were making commercial country records. And, um, we spent so much time and labored over, are we gonna say and here? We're not gonna say and, or is it, uh, you know, these little bitty syllables and stuff. That's how much time and effort we put into these songs. And then we get a guitar player that comes in and plays his guitar on our song as opposed to playing our song on his guitar. We would like for people to actually do this, you know, and I, I don't know, I was just, Dumb enough at the time to go, well, it sounds like a good idea. Why don't you know, yeah, want to play a melody here or why don't I get out of the way? And you know, they wanted someone with great, a greater investment, yeah, yeah, just just well, they they wanted their records not to sound like the guitar players, yeah, you know, they wanted to sound like that. And I, you know, and it worked out, I had yeah. a blast and I learned a lot on those sessions. You know, my first, my first session with them, um. 18 guys, Chip Hardy was the co-producer, or no, was the producer. Rick and Janice were the artists, and it was David Hungate, and John Jarvis, Jerry Kroon, do you remember Jerry Kroon, yeah, drummer, drummer. Yeah. Um, and Marcus Stevens and myself. Okay. Wow. Marcus Stevens, come on. Yeah, um, great, the, the great acoustic player in town. I am such a fan of Mark's. It's, it's unbelievable, not, it, these other guys are great too, but yeah. I've got a connection with Mark. Um, and man, whew. oh, this is, this is great. I was, as a matter of fact, the first session, I was nervous. And I remember I had the little Yamaha amplifier. I remember the ones, the small ones, they had the little pull, yeah. pull knobs on it. I thought it sounded pretty good, you know? And they're setting me up, we're at Emerald, you know? And, and Emerald was a premier studio at the time. Yeah. I'm setting my gear up back in the, in the booth and they had called Dale Sellers in and I just, read Dale Sellers' name on records and stuff like that. And Dale's in there and they wanted somebody, I guess Scotty Moore wasn't doing stuff anymore. I'm not sure when, if, when he retired or what he was working over there, had that tape company where he's providing cassettes to people. Yeah. And they, we want you to do the Scotty Moore thing and you kind of, you know, a little bit Chet Atkins light kind of fat stuff. So they got Dale in there and Dale's in there. And this is like, it's my first major session, you know, and, and Dale comes and he's got that guitar on wrong handed anyway, you know, he's plays like this and I'm being quiet because he's overdubbing in the big room. I'm in the ISO booth called, oh man, I thought gonna, you know, I can't plug this thing in and make any sound before. And, you know, I don't know what's going to, how long are they going to want to go downbeat and stuff like that. They're too, super chill. Dale comes in after he's done, you know, and they're wrapping up his gear and Steve Tillish was the engineer and Dale comes in. He gets right in, my, right in my face and goes, son, show me your hottest lick. 
I showed him my hottest lick. Yeah. Just something fell out, I, you know? Yeah. But I don't know. And that was like my welcome to the bigs yeah. deal with Dale. He's gonna, he was like, oh, that's pretty cool. Show me that. <laughs> hey, check this out. And all of a sudden, man, I'm in there trading licks with Dale Sellers, who was on all yeah. these great hit records. And, and Steve Tillish, this, you know, unbelievable engineer, is, it assesses the situation right now. And he's like, I'm going to help this young guy out. Yeah. The guitar sounded good. The recordings went good. De-escalated, and so anyway, that was kind of my initial thing. But I was brought in to be that color bender guy yeah. through that stuff. So I guess it, it seems like you learned from that that you didn't want to be a chameleon session guy. You I want, didn't. You wanted to be, you know, a stylist. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And and I and I've worked really hard intentionally to do that, and um, so the stuff with the Carnes, and they went from, from different labels and drug me with them over into the Bowen camp, and we yeah. did stuff over there. Um, and it was always they, Joe, Rick and Janice, all these other people kept on encouraging me to do something um, as an individual and unique, and keep on kind of, they nurtured me to, to spend more time and more effort on that. Yeah. And I think that was really good counsel because that's already where my heart was, Yeah, you know? And the fact that I just really wasn't good at the other stuff also. Yeah. That's, that's also an important part about this. I was good at this, I really wasn't so good at this. Yeah. But you focused on the stuff that you were good at. I did, I did, and so when we, uh, when Rio, I joined, a, actually, I actually got off the road with Mel McDaniel. And this is right around, around that time. And that's when I learned that I thought I wanted to be a, a session guy. Yeah. You know, and it was, it was during that time that actually Skaggs offered me the gig when Ray quit. Really? Yeah. And I was playing with Sis, a, a sister duo at the Western Room. Mm -hmm. Did you ever go to the Western Room? No. Oh man, it was a really, really weird gig because it was a tiny stage that was elevated and it was, it was, there were four of us up there, these two, no, there's five of us, two girls, one of the girls' husbands played bass and a drummer, Mark Presley and, and myself, and it was elevated behind the bar, okay? So here's the bar, here's yes. where the bartenders are, and we're standing yeah, back above here, the bar. Yeah. yeah, in the, in Printer's Alley at the Western Room. And I remember I had just- I have been there, yes. Okay, yeah, so yeah, you know yeah, what I'm yeah. talking about. I know about. what you're talking about, yeah. And so I was huge, I'm a bluegrasser. I was a huge Ricky Skaggs fan. I'm still a Ricky Skaggs fan. Love what he does. And I had all these country gentleman records that he was on and the J.D. Crow stuff and some of the Stanley Brothers stuff. And I, I mean, I was really into, and part of my transition, you know, oh, Skaggs played with Emmy Lou and, and was on this Dolly record and I got that stuff. And so that was part of me coming along and then listening to Ray play, yeah. which he was pushing my buttons because he was an individual and he had that thing where, you know, it's Ray and it was, Fantastic, you know, I'm a huge Ray fan. So when he called me to take over from Ray, I was like, well, I mean, cause this was like a late night call from Ricky Skaggs out of the blue to me. So he hadn't come and seen you play or anything. You've never interacted with Ricky at all. All of a sudden he's just calling you. Okay, so I had made some cassettes for Joe. Joe asked me to make some Bender cassettes. Okay. And those cassettes went to Steve Warner, went to Ricky Skaggs, went to Brent Rowan. Wow. Because they had bought and they had gotten these Bender guitars. Yeah. Okay, and I think Joe recognized that I was doing something, a I wasn't doing Clarence's stuff. Yeah. I had worked on this other stuff. And so he's like, will you do this for me? And so I, I spent, and so I'm putting two to two, two and two together. Maybe I'm coming up with five, but I think that he may have been aware of me from those cassettes because yeah. that's who they were for. Um, so anyway, he calls me and it was just definitely gulp. Yeah. Shot of adrenaline to the chest. Skaggs is on the phone offering me the gig because Ray's out of there. And you know what? I simply was not ready for that. Yeah. You know, and I had just got off the road with Mel McDaniel and I was, I still, I still hadn't figured the session thing. I didn't figure out that it really wasn't my trajectory. Um, and I was just like, I gotta follow this. You know, he was very gracious about it. 
Um, but anyway, it was in that period of doing that stuff. So anyway, I digress. I forget where yeah. our question. I'm no, so I missed mean, the backstory that's, that's, here today. That's, uh, you know, I, I've never, I mean, get my name dropping in here, Zach. You know, no, I'm, I'm, I'm good. You know, we had, we had to recover from the from the past falls that I've created. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, the, but no, I had never heard that that you were uh, you were offered. You know, the, but it was the, that it was that much. I think I called, yeah. I said, let me think about that. I called yeah. him back. I said, yeah, I just can't do it. And yeah. you know what? That was. Uh, that was a, it was just where I felt. It, now in retrospect, that was a really good move. Yeah. Because I'm thinking anybody following the Skaggs gig other than Ricky playing his own stuff is not gonna go well following Ray. Yeah. Who's gonna do that? You, that's yeah. gonna have an impact like that. It, you can't follow, yeah. Right, I mean, you'd have to bring in, you know, Tom Britt to come in and be greasy slide guy. You'd have to bring in a stylist that was. It'd have to be something different almost. Yeah, yeah. something just yeah. super cool and different and you know, it yeah. was just gonna be less than at yeah. that point. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So so when, when did this guitar, I'm just gonna yank this up and uh, so th this is, uh, people call this the Taxicaster. Is that what you call this? Yes. Okay. So, because it's yellow, yeah, and, and it's you, checkered, and you got the checkerboard, yeah. yeah, it's like a little marathon, yeah. So, when did you get this? That was in the 80s, and that was uh, so the second guitar that Joe built for me, obviously post Nashville pickup because mm -hmm. it was made with that, that pickup stuff. But, um, I don't have them anymore, but we went to pretty good links. And I don't know if this stuff has been replaced, but um, I mean, no, 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 no. I think maybe this stuff, the black hardware was available when we made that Strat. Yeah. All of the chrome hardware was not available yet. You couldn't buy that stuff. We actually yeah. had to take all that stuff and get it plated. Yeah. So that was, that was in the 80s. So and it was you, my you, second yeah. double bender guitar. You know, I worked on that, that tobacco, solid maple, harsh Telecaster for quite a while before I got that. And when, that, when I got that, it was just like, oh, man, so much nicer sound, just yeah. incredible, yeah. So, so you, you've got that, by, so by mid 80s or something like that, you've got that, or, or late 80s? Yeah, um, I'm thinking 83 maybe. Okay. Something like that. Yeah. I'm trying to think of, yeah, I'm thinking maybe 84. Yeah. Or so like that. I played that that tobacco guitar for a while and a couple years at Belmont, 79, 80, 81, blah, 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 yeah. blah, blah. Played, the, played that tobacco guitar, something about 84, 85, something like that. Okay. Because I think I may have been playing that when I was with, when I was part, part of the Youth of America out at Opryland. Yeah. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> that was good. You're br bringing the energy level up. Yeah. 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 <laughs> So, Dude, I, 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 Opryland, that was the only gig I've ever had where there was a, uh, we had a time card. Coming back around, so, so you're, uh, you, you're offered a gig with, with Skaggs, you're, you're doing session work, so bring us into, uh, into you know, what becomes the germination of, of, you know, the band that eventually gets signed. Oh, okay, so the Tennessee River Boys, um, so remember in, uh, was it 79 or 80, I had worked in Country Music USA at Opryland, right. which is the big, if anybody's seen this, it was their big, large cast country music show. And it was a big impersonation show, lots of singing and dancing, right. very Opryland. It was, you know, for what it was, it was a really cool thing. I mean, they did a really good job with this. Yeah. And I, maybe 16 singers and dancers, costume changes, Velcro stuff. Yeah. And they and they all come out and they sing part of the hits of, of the day and of, of yeah, know, they, they imitate different singers. So yeah. so our lead singer in Diamond Rio, Marty Rowe, I mean, he was in Flat and Scruggs during that with Stephen Curtis Chapman. They were Flat and Scruggs. Oh, wow. Yeah. And Skip Ewing was in their cast and, you know. <laughs> Yeah. Mary Elizabeth Mastrantonio, you know, the yeah. actress from The Deep, she was out there and uh, I hear America singing or something like that. So anyway, so that was out at, at Opryland. Yeah. Yeah, and it's, uh, 
Interesting. I'm sorry, I forgot your question already. No, it was the the, the germinations of the band oh, that okay, eventually yeah. get signed. Okay, so so, all right. So, Larry Beard was the guitar player. In are you familiar with Larry? Yeah. Great acoustic session player now. Yeah. Hard working guy, and really fine guitar player. And he was the Tennessee River Boys guitar player. And um, Larry left the band, and they were they did a cattle call audition down at, um, at the Union, in that little sunken pit room yeah, down there. Yeah. And I got, I think I was the last slot of the auditions. Mel Deal got, was in the band. Are you familiar with Mel? Yeah, yeah. Mel got me, me the audition with these guys, and it was to go work, the, work a year out at Opryland. And let me tell you, Zach, the session thing really wasn't working out for me, and I wasn't <laughs> on the road. I'd been playing at the Western Room, and you know, I'd gotten offered the, job from Skaggs and you know, I've done some of these master sessions that were on the radio and stuff like on Tennessee River Boys. Ugh. It's going back to Opryland. That was, you know, yeah. that was so beneath. Now that this is still the band I'm in now. Yeah. <laughs> okay. At yeah. the time I was like, Ugh. Yeah. Oh, but you needed the money. I needed the money and I told them, oh man, yeah, I'm in here for the long haul. You're right. Yeah, you guys yeah. gonna get a record deal? Sure. I'm, this is gonna be great. Yeah. I'm all in. Yeah, I was just wanting to go out there and do that season of Opryland and then trying to see if I can get my life together, you know, as a player or something like that. And so um, I got the gig and uh, we did that last um, season at Opryland. This first time I was Matt Davenport wrote a lot of songs and he was the bass player. And, and I started doing some songwriting and some co-writing and really loved that. Again, with my nature, it's... It's an individual thing. It's something that I can imprint, something that I can make up and not take and, and repeat from somebody else. So I really love songwriting. I really like you know the composition stuff and lyric writing and all that stuff. And so there were a lot of really cool things that were happening and I was going, man, these guys in this band, they're actually really good. You know, if I take any of my Opryland stigma away from it, because you know, Opryland was not, um, it was a theme park that had musicians at it. And the music business was the music business. Right, they were separate. And they were not only separate, but the music business thought what I thought. Right, they, they thought very negatively. This is pretty cheesy yeah. over here, yeah. you know. Um, but I got, I got here with these really great musicians and these guys that had a plan and they wanted to get a record deal and they wanted to have records and they wanted to do this thing. And the show that we did out there was, um, did we do maybe an original song in that? Maybe, but it was the contemporary country stuff. And at that time, I think it was Country Boy. Skaggs had Country Boy out at the time. And we had, we had that was part of the show. Was, you know, you'd get out there and normal schedule was 25 minute show four times a day. Long days was six times a day. You know, punch the clock and yeah. pick up my wardrobe. They would, I would, they'd give me my wardrobe, like six outfits of identical clothes that had, you know, just as if I was a mechanic, had Olander in the back of it and stuff like that. Put that on, and I did that, and man, I drank the Kool-Aid. And yeah. I'm still liking that Kool-Aid, because I'm still here, you know? And that was like, I wanna say maybe 86, something yeah. like that, 84, 86, 85, I don't know, 86, let's say, let's say 86, since there'll be no fact checking on yes, this one. there's no fact checking. <laughs> okay. No. Um, and that's where that started to germinate. And there was a, a, one of uh, Bill Anderson's drummers, Snuck, Snuffy Miller, I think that was his name, Snuffy Miller, had produced some sides on um, the Tennessee River Boys. And Larry had played on that. And I remember going out to, I guess it's Owen Bradley's place. I, I think I want to say it's Lebanon or Hermitage or something like that. Mount Juliet. Yeah, Mount that's Juliet. Where the, that's where the, the Bradley's barn okay, was. Okay, I was. We we're out of Bradley's yeah. barn. I went yeah. out and and uh, replaced Larry on that type of stuff, and Snuffy was going to pitch that stuff around. Really didn't go anywhere, but you know, the songs weren't weren't, weren't really really good. But somehow, through that, we had. Um, connected with Keith Stegall. Yeah. And Keith had heard the band, liked the band, and was gonna produce us, and did produce us, to try to get us a record deal. And, uh, and that was a really interesting thing because you know, Brent was playing with Keith on the road when Keith was an artist. Right. 
and they're and, close. And, and we all know that I'm, I love Brent, and I'm going, oh man, this guy works with Brent Mason, and then I start hanging around Keith, and I start hearing about Keith and just witnessing his talent. He had that big Al Jarreau, we're in this love together, wrote that, and, yeah. and he, was a, he was a great singer and a really good producer and all that stuff, and uh, this was pretty cool. And we're over at Keith's stuff. I'd never been in a, you know, at the time, what I thought was an elaborate home studio, but this dude works at home. And his basement is all tricked out, and it was really, really cool. It was very, very cool. Um, and interesting, while we were in there, our bass player, Matt Davenport, was the lead singer in the band. And Marty Rowe, our current, Diamond Rio's current lead singer, was sang the high harmony and played mandolin. And uh, I think Marty would say probably more of a mandolin owner than a player, but you know, and we play, played it and we did all that, that, that stuff. But through the tracking sessions where Matt wasn't gonna sing, scratch, and play bass, Marty sang lead and the bass player all of a sudden just became the bass player. Mm -hmm. And Keith went, oh, look, you're the lead singer. Yeah. And you know what, I can remember going, yeah, because Marty had a had more character in it, and he sounded more like the guys that I liked. He had a little bit more breath in his voice. I mean, all the other singers were great. I mean, they were really, really good singers. Danny Gregg was a, an incredible performer. Paul Gregg's brother from Restless Heart. Yeah. We were very synergistic with Restless Heart because all these guys worked together on the Porter Wagner show at Opryland. They had worked at Opryland, the Gregg brothers, and yeah. I knew Jennings from, from Opryland and, and stuff. I remember doing strolling fiddle and banjo gigs out there, running into Jennings at the Opryland Hotel in a tuxedo and a jazz guitar as I'm cruising by on a banjo, you know, yeah. just doing that stuff. So we knew them anyway, but Keith had switched, out, switched Marty over because Matt was a great singer, but he had that kind of smooth baritone that wasn't Lefty Frizzell. It was more like a Jim Reeves thing, you know, where it was, it was a quality, it was a great voice, but it didn't have the amount of character that pushed my buttons. And so when Marty started singing, I was like, oh my God, I actually really got excited. You know, I'm still kind of, well, this, this, maybe this will go great, maybe this, but man, yeah. And you heard him. Yeah, and we've got, and at this time, we've got Keith's material, which was leaps and bounds better than anything we'd ever heard. Yeah. You know, I went, to, I remember going down and seeing Pat Higdon before, you know, we were the Tennessee River Boys. Right. Going in and getting songs pitched by Pat. Pat's just, yeah, I'm sorry, I understand. I'm not getting the top shelf no, stuff. He's not gonna give you the, be the best material that he has. He's gonna he's give gonna... me something that's been sitting around for a while, probably really good songs and yeah. stuff like that. But, um, you know, I, I, I agree with that, that whole technique. Yeah. You know, don't waste it on this, this cheese balls from Opryland. So we got the, the Keith stuff and, and for what we had done in with Keith, it was way better than what we had done with Snuffy. And I was like, man, boy, <laughs> yeah. I want to be a household name here, you know? That's right. And, and in fact, uh, it didn't happen, but the, but the money finally ran out with me gigging around and I was, we were, you know, we were suffering there in, in, in uh, the Tennessee River Boys because we had left Opryland and had made the commitment. We're not going back for the easy money. We're going to go out. We're going to try to do this. And of all things, I can't imagine this happening today. We all, we mostly did original material. I'd pull the banjo out for a banjo piece maybe now and then. And uh, but we, kind of, you know, we're a band trying to make a living playing original country music. Yeah, that's unheard it's a, of. It, well, yeah, that's and, tough. And the money was unheard of because. Yeah. It was, we were, you know, it was po below poverty wages. And finally the, the, the money runs out and we've got this stuff that's being pitched by Keith, right? And I had to take my first day job. And luckily Marty had worked with Bob Wellerding over at Sunrise in Nashville. And I said, man, you think you can get me on over there? And Marty was just like, hey man, just start showing up, you know, and, and you know, grass cutters and whatever, you know. Yeah. They're, yeah, they're not grass. necessarily the, you know, yeah. really rigid for gonna be there every day. And I yeah. always, and so all of a sudden, Marty and I are a team, you know. Uh, he's my boss, kinda, he's the superior guy because they yeah. went to school at, at Lipscomb together, he and Wellarding. 
and we're out there in Wellading always, and, and we would go out and we'd do shows. And we're trying to do stuff down on Music Row. And we're trying to get this career going. And he'd always make, have, amuse himself so much because the Welk Building was one of his things. And he says, I'm sending you guys to the Welk Building. And I said, oh, man. And so I get, at this time, I'm now cutting grass and trimming hedges. I get a call from Lee Greenwood. I mean, he offers me the gig, right? And I was like, you know, Lee, and whatever he offered me sounded like a million dollars a week. I mean, it was yeah. a lot of money from what I was used to. And uh, he offers me this gig and I was like, I would feel ungenuine if I took this gig with you and something happened. I told him the whole Keith Stegall thing. And if we got signed, I'd quit, yeah. you know, and I'd be doing my whole thing. Is I said, I don't, you know, you do with that as you would wish. And he says, you know what? I appreciate that. I'm looking for a guitar player, not, a bridge for you, you know, yeah. and, and he was gracious and, and whatever. It's maybe two and a half, three weeks later, I get in there and Mar I says, what's on the list? You know, we're hitting these different properties. Well, we're going out to Melanie's house because they Melanie and Lee Greenwood had separated. We got to do Melanie's and Lee Greenwood's house today. So I just turned down a gig right. to go out and make good money playing guitar for him, but I'm going to cut his grass. Yeah. Oh, Ooh. it was tough. Yeah. It was tough. Yeah. And, and you know, then the Keith Stegall thing never really got, yeah. you know, just kind of like a lot of those things, it just kind of yeah. fell on dead ears and didn't go anywhere. So one thing that just hearing you tell your story, I, I hear the importance of relationships and friendships. It seems like Joe Glazer was, was incredibly important in, uh, in your career. He's, you know, he's just important in my life. Yeah. You know, he still is. I don't see Joe very often. We don't see each other very often, but yeah, yeah I still have a huge affection for Joe and connection with him. Yeah. And he's done some amazing things for me and helped me in ways that we would not be talking now. Yeah. Had he not been in my life, for sure. Yeah. His, his, his bit, you know, the double vendor mechanism and the, the guitars that you play, you know, your main instruments were, were hand built by him. Yeah, and I mean, he took, uh, like in some of my other favorite instruments, he made them usable. So, yeah. um, like I've got this, this great John Grevin guitar, and uh, it was actually Mo West that eyeballed this. This was like Mo West genius, right? Um, had this great John Grevin acoustic guitar. It's, um, it's kind of like the quadruple O Martin shape, but okay. when they did that, when John was coming up with this thing, they took the F hole sides from the old Martin F hole guitars, and they put just a slightly arch in the in the back and a flat top and a round hole, and that was their that was their guitar. I think Martin came out with the M series, yeah. and it was that body style. Right, and that the the planets a lot, you know. I think that there's a lot more art form in, a, in making acoustic instruments than there are electric instruments, right? Yeah, I mean, just yeah. the planets aligning and just there's a, lot, there's a lot more to it. And that guitar, all the planets aligned, but the scale was off, okay? And I used to always fight that guitar. And, you know, I don't always play in tune, but I aspire to be in tune yeah. all the time. And so with this John Grevin guitar, man, it's, you got a great guitar, you can't hardly use it. And so I remember Mo West seeing it. I, he must have been with Joe. I must have been in there going, getting something else on it. And he goes by, he sees that guitar. You got the old Randy Woods uh, fret scale on this. And I went, what? And he goes, yeah. Odd, even, odd, even, odd, even, odd, you are at a different it's not graduated. Mm -hmm. And this was a class, evidently this was a thing. You know, Randy's great builder and stuff like that. I don't know anything more about this than what Mo told me. Yeah. But he visualized it, looked at it. I don't even think I complained about the guitar. And he just said, huh, it's Randy Wood flip. <laughs> what do you mean? He says, well, do you notice that these, the odds and the evens are going at a different way? You know, these are, this is not, quite red and it wasn't random it was a pattern to it yeah and so joe took this guitar pulled everything filled the fingerboard redid the math cut that 
recut that thing for me. And now I've got this great guitar that I've owned for a long time that was custom built for me. And now it's a killer. I can play it all the time. He also did that for that a steel body national. Yeah. That was super cool. I got it over at George's, you know, and I noticed, you know, by this time I was recording and I was pro tooling and I'm doing all that stuff and man, working on overdubs by myself, I wanted to use that guitar. It sounded so cool. So it's like tune for this position, get through blah, 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 mm -hmm. retune, blah, 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 retune, blah, blah, blah. And you get this kind of not fluid thought idea, but things are in tune, just, you know, not really usable. But man, yeah. when I found out it only costs money, you can be in tune. <laughs> It only costs. It yeah. only costs money, baby. All these cool money. sounding guitars yes. they can actually play into. Yeah, you just, yeah, just spend the money to have the frets moved. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Getting up to you know to Diamond Rio, you know, of course you, you had uh, you know Clive Davis had started you know Arista, Tim Dubois who had a background with Restless Heart as kind of producer and songwriter to a degree, but he wasn't super experienced, and then he was he was made the you know the head of this label. And they, they sign all these acts. So y'all get signed and... Yeah, we got so that, that wasn't immediate. Yeah. Though, because Tim knows, you know, Greg Jennings, Paul Greg. Yeah. Okay. He knows these guys about Opryland. He knows about Opryland and getting, you know, pitched this band from Opryland. He means, ugh, ugh you know, immediately got that whatever connotation comes along with this theme park. Yeah. You know, I understand it. I mean, I'm not judging Tim for it. It's just, I would probably have the same reaction. Um, well, I did have the same reaction. I was just going to join the band to go out there and make some money and get out of there. Um, so, yeah, he, he did that and he was like, yeah, I don't think so. And then he had a band up in Canada that he was about to sign well, these guys are really good. I'm going to sign them. And uh, we're like, we had actually begged on a show to um, open for George Jones, like down in Anniston, Alabama. And Monty Powell, who uh, produced the first two or three records with Tim co-producing, Monty did a lot of the heavy lifting in this type of, in, 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 the, in the sessions. Um, Monty begged Tim to come, hey man, because he was he and Marty were college roommates at, Lip, at Lipscomb. He, I want you to come down and listen to this band. This is my college roommate. He's been writing, and Marty had been singing some uh, demos for uh, Dave from Restless Heart, and he was doing some demo singing and stuff like that. And so he came down and he saw us, and I think that they had just signed Exile as well, signing this band from Canada. He just signed to Exile, and here's another band. He says, man, I've been working with Restless Heart. Bands are difficult. Bands are difficult at radio. Bands are difficult to get a decision from because it needs to go through a committee. Right. Uh, just in general, what do you do with this band? You know, there's not really a face. It's usually a logo, you know, to promote. So it's just, just more difficult. He was not interested in the band. Came down and saw us, really liked what we were doing, and we went and we cut some stuff at Midtown Tone and Volume that Mike Clute and Monty Powell and Van Stevenson, the guy, the modern day Delilah Blackhawk. We went and cut stuff and it was, it was great. So, but it's so funny that the band in Canada, he kind of got sour on it because he went up and saw them, they're all a bunch of fat guys. And he's just like, man, <laughs> we're doing country music videos. I don't think we're gonna be able to do this, you know? And I don't know the band, I don't know, I don't yeah. know, I can't tell you how overweight they were, but, yeah. but uh, we were in, because we were, yeah. you know, at the time, <laughs> you know, we still had more on top and less in the middle. That's changed some, but, you yeah. know, so, yeah. Anyway, he signed us, and we were the last of that first class of Arista. Yeah. Um, I think a Alan Jackson was the, was the first to be released, and we were probably the last to be released. Exile was in there, and Rob Crosby, and Michelle Wright, and um, Leroy Parnell. I can't remember. Brooks who, and Dunn. Uh, no. That was the second group. That was the second wave. Okay. Um, anyway, there, there might have been a couple of others yeah. that were in that first. And we, it was cool. 
Yeah. He came and saw us and we went in there and cut some stuff. And, and Tim is great to work with. He's great to work with. And immediately in the studio, I told you about some of my lack of experience. I had more experience by this time, but we we're also in there working with Mike Clute. And Mike engineered all that stuff, eventually started producing the stuff when Monty left. Um, but Mike and I are just thick as thieves and best buds. And he really helped me and helped everybody get stuff and really took great pains for a bunch of guys, you know, because remember, this is also before auto-tune, and yeah. this is before all that stuff, and, and we wanted to have those, those vocals nuts on, and mm -hmm. the parts needed to be nuts on, and you know, I wasn't necessarily the acoustic guitar technician that, let's say, Larry Beard or some, you know, Brian Sutton, Marcus Stevens is, and so, man, you can hear, I remember on that first record, trying to cut a tune, and I was so tired. I was, my head was on the, on that Grevin guitar, and I was, you can hear, it's, uh, they don't make hearts like they used to off our first record. You can hear me breathing into the microphone because I had been doing this part over and over, and it was a ballad, and you yeah, know, I was- It's hard. I, I could play fast stuff, but I couldn't play, you know, beautiful things, and yeah. you can hear these big sighs in there, just all <laughs> part of the, just being a novice. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I had assumed that you had played most of the acoustic stuff on the, on your. I have played all the stuff. Okay. Yeah. 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 Um, and and love it. Yeah. You know, wouldn't wouldn't want it any other way. And it's good. And it's good. And so, played all the stuff, and and my partners were generous enough that they let me come up with the motifs and the hooks. Most of the motifs and hooks. Uh, Dan's come up with a, with with some really great motifs and hooks. Uh, you're gone is a great, great thing. And he's got several of those two things. But for the most part, I was coming up with the motifs and the hooks. And, yeah. and it, was, it was, you know, I liked to do it. And it was somewhat self-serving because I didn't, because we did a lot of three-part stuff where the mandolin and the piano and the guitar are all playing the same line. Uh, we did a lot of that stuff live, but we did it all in our recordings. And I also learned if I came up with the stuff I was gonna be playing my parts and I didn't have to learn anything exactly. and they were guitar parts and the piano player was gonna to have to play the guitar stuff on the piano and the mandolin player was gonna to have to do that. Yeah. Uh, like, I forget uh, what Love A Little Stronger was a hit that we had had and Dan had done this cool riff going into the verse and I had to play that and I was just like, what is that? You know, I was like, man, turn around is not fair play here. Turn yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I only want to be the one. I want to be the, the one that's just playing my stuff. But, but you figure out how to double it or yes. play a harmony yeah. to it. Yeah. So you know, of, of course, you know, Diamond Rio has a has a, a ton of success. You know, right off the right off the bat. I mean, just again, like we you know mentioned earlier, thirty years ago, you had uh, you know a number one <laughs> again. You know, right off, right off the bat, which which is amazing. I mean, most acts you know don't have a nice a number save. One. Nice save, yeah, Zach. See? So you had uh, about two or three albums in. You had a major health scare. Yeah, and this is taking a turn. Yeah, it's take it's taking a turn. And I heard, and you, you tell me if this is wrong or not, that it had it was serious enough that you were talking to another guitar player about potentially you know being able to uh, to play your parts. Uh yeah, yeah. Um, I was already starting to divvy up the guitars. Yeah. Who was getting what? Yeah. Um, yeah, it was, it, was, it was interesting. I had, and I had this happen to me twice. Um, but I specifically remember it happening uh, during the cut of the album Love a Little Stronger, yeah. like the third record. And um, man, the, the, the symptoms were horrific. So I had, I had like, and man, they were, a lot of them were HIV and that was a big scare at that time. And I wasn't necessarily a candidate yeah. for, I was kind of a goody two shoes. I wasn't a big whoremonger or anything like that. I'd, that but man, I, night sweats, I would have, to, I would just drench the bed and yeah. have to change sheets and pajamas every night. Um, naturally fatigue, weight loss. And I was having trouble swallowing things because I, it turns out I had this big tumor in my chest. It's about the size of a lemon. And that's pretty big when yeah. 
all the other parts are essential, and you get this big thing in there. Um, remember, who was my oncologist? Was 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 Doctor? No, I forget the oncologist name, but he was next to another doctor, Van Hooey Donk, and, <laughs> and so that's what we called the tumor. So yeah. I got my Van Hooey Donk in here, and it was doing that stuff, and so yeah, so I had I had prepped Greg Jennings had learned okay. the show, you know, and I actually paid him to learn the show because. There's just a lot of, I overplay a little bit, and there's just a lot of guitars, a lot of notes. If you're going to actually come out and do it well, I have a lot of stuff. And Greg, you know, he could fall off a log and play every, anything that I would play, but still you have to do the work to learn the stuff. Yeah. And so I had prepped Greg to do that, and um, man. And I guess he was somewhat prepared in a way in that he, he was already used to using a double bender. Yeah. Yeah. And it's Greg Jennings. And he's a great player. It's yeah. Greg, yeah. yeah. He's yeah. really a great guitar player. Yeah. I, I had heard that, uh, that Greg Jennings was the, was the guy that you had uh, you know, kind of picked out to, uh, to potentially you know, fill in for you. How have the six you know, members of the band been able to stay together all these 30 plus years? It's, it's a good gig. Yeah. It's a good gig. Uh, and... And we've had good success, and we've constantly been surrounded by great people, you know? And so there has not been any kind of, uh, there's not been any really outside influence or divisiveness amongst managers and label. I, we've, it's, I've never, it's always been a super harmonious working relationship with people outside of the band. And then on the inside of the band, um, we made an agreement early on that cost dearly if you quit or got fired. Okay, and we signed a little little agreement amongst yeah. ourselves. If you quit, you walk. That's it. There's no financial. We're not we're not assessing the finances. You're not getting paid for anything. Yeah. You know, you're going to make your the royalties off of whatever. Yeah, uh, you know that's going to be, but from Diamond Rio, you will be getting nothing. Yeah, so if you, if quit, you, you walk get, away with nothing, if you get fired, there are six guys in the band. It's a unanimous decision between five guys, and we buy you out. Yeah, at market value. So it costs the. We really want to fire somebody. If we're going to fire somebody, and if somebody wants to quit, they really want to quit. Yeah, and the threshold has never been that great. Wow. To, to surpass this, and we've yeah. we've had um, three or four personality interventions. Um, we haven't had any drugs and alcohol stuff, but we we've had some personality stuff yeah. that that you know we had to deal with. But we always did that, you know, like brothers. We'd usually be on the road, and somebody's just getting diamond ego. You know, and needs to get knocked down a little bit, and it's just it's getting disruptive. And we, you know, back in the time when we were semis and multiple tour buses, just shut them all down and say, we're we're all going into this hotel room, and we're going to get this talked out, and we'll roll when we come back. Wow. You know, and it's always worked out. And those, those, you know, not me from being emotionally stilted, but it was always, oh man, I love you. You yeah. know, by the end of those, yeah, you know, might have been difficult conversations. Yeah. So I think um, a fact of the, the, the buying out, the not buying out, I think um, treating each other with respect. And you know, when we record, the partners really don't say anything to one another about their parts. What you're doing is what you're doing. Yeah. And we're not going to pass judgment on that. And I, I actually really like what my partners do. Yeah. You know? Um, our drummer, Brian's great. When he plays, it's always the right thing. He always sounds great. And he's also a great performer on stage and fun to watch. There, I don't know another tenor singer like Gene Johnson. I mean, his sound is so distinctive. And when I hear him in the studio, you know, I've cut vocals down here and stuff. And when I hear what Gene does for choices, I'm like, man, you know, I think I'm pretty cool sometimes. I would have never thought 
to do that. There's nothing on this harmony thing and he's going in a different direction. And it's not just like, nah, uh, you know, a little lick that you've heard a thousand times. It'll yeah. be something that he's gonna go out and hang. Was low. It resolved. Yeah. The rest of everybody resolved. He just got there early, you know. It's just like, golly, man, it's masterful. Dana, super unbelievable. You know, he's he's not a like the the high wow factor bass player, but man, I look at his parts in Pro Tools up against the kick drum. I was like, they're right with it. They're nuts on, baby, yeah. and plays good parts. And our piano player, I think he's probably our best musician. Just, he's, he's so freaky. I remember when we were cutting over it at, uh, at the Fiside building downstairs, that space. We had, Ray Kennedy had his space over here, and Clute had his space over here. And Truman, I've never known somebody to not play along. You know, like there would be pre-roll on tape. You put up any pre-roll, that's fine. Truman never hit a key, never get in the groove until we're dropping in. We got to fix this little part in the middle of a solo. He'd just yeah. be sitting there. And he's quiet, a little bit quiet anyway. He's just sitting there at the keyboard and we're like, oh man, I think his phones might be out. He can't hear us or anything like that. And as soon as it goes red, bam, 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 bam. And he, he's, done, he's done, he doesn't play another note after. It's like he's got so many notes in his life and he's saving them or something. Yeah. I don't, and great, he'll play something great, in time, fantastic. I was like, you're a weirdo. What yeah. are you doing? Yeah. So anyway, Dan's great and Marty, you know. Well, as soon as I heard him singing through that Keith Seagull stuff, I was like, Wow, still one of my favorite singers. There, we've got recordings that I listen to, and the outro of oh, it's a Phil Vassar song that we wrote. He and Andy Roboff. Uh, anyway, I listened to his outro on this thing, and I was like, "Damn, I work with that guy. Really great." Yeah. So, um, I don't hear these stories from my partners. I hope they feel the same way, but I definitely really respect what they do. You know. So. So Joe made the Taxicaster for you, and yes. then he made this guitar. So uh, when, when did he build this one? Okay, so this guitar, uh, Maybell, was made when we were promoting our first record. Okay. So I cut Meet in the Middle and the stuff on the first record on the ta Taxicaster. Okay. And then um, this was put together as a prop guitar for a video. Wow. Okay, okay. so for Mama, Don't Forget to Pray for Me, um, Mother Maybell was was the first the first song I learned to play on the guitar. I learned to play in the drop thumb style Wildwood Flower. Yeah. And so Mother Maybell and the Carters have a, I have great affection for them, uh, for my developments and stuff like that. So I was like, hey man, what if we built a guitar? You know, I'm talking to Glazer, like world renowned uh, guy, and I'm asking him to basically make me a prop. Naturally, Joe's a lot smarter than I am, and so he's like, well, actually, why don't I just make you a really, really good guitar? So um, while I was doing the, the, the cosmetic thing, I, Chris Skinker, who was the librarian at the Country Music Hall, Hall of Fame, um, let me into the archives, and I went through all the Carter family stuff, and I found this little picture of Mother Maybell, and it was the, like one of the only ones where she wasn't in an auto harp or with the sisters or yeah. anything like that. And she actually has a guitar. And so it was, yeah. it was just a little bitty thing. And so I think they made a negative for me and I blew it up to an 11 by 14 and then Nancy Cooley colorized it for me. Now this whole time I'm all about the aesthetics of this thing and all of this and Glazer's gone. Okay, I, he's been sitting on this neck since, when, since he made Skaggs's purple guitar yeah. for me. And I don't actually think that maybe the neck, he'd just the, the wood, he'd been sitting on that. Uh, didn't do that and wanted to go with a swamp ash. And then Seymour and Joe came in cahoots because um, when I was playing the yellow guitar, if I set the treble strings to where they sounded nice, the bass strings were too woolly. Yeah. And when I got the bass strings right, the treble strings were too shrill. Yeah, And so I think it was, might've been Joe's idea that talked Seymour into wine in this form, where he took the bass strings from the old stock Fender things, the Alnico 5s, and put the Alnico 2s, and that's an Alnico 2 all the way yeah. on that guitar, but put the Alnico 2s on the top. Yeah. And as a result. <laughs> open and nice. Nice sounding guitar. 
Yeah, you, you get more of the, the compression from the two and they're a little bit softer sounding. And so right. yeah, it, it yeah. makes it evens it out. Yeah, yeah, beautiful. Yeah, he did a really nice, that uh, kind of mid fifties blonde finish on there. And uh, you know. It's, is that what that is? Okay. Yeah. This has been, this has been relic. I guess it's, yeah, it's kind of. It's relic famous. by myself. Yeah. Yeah, this one, I think this was, this was actually the guitar that I was filming. Do um, you remember the, the syndicated show, The Road? Yeah, yeah. Remember this? Okay, the yeah, road. Yeah, it was really high production value. Yeah, they. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so it was yeah. it was it was Diamond Rio, Marty Stewart, Leroy Parnell, and I think they had five acts. Okay, and so we all had a separate backdrop. Marty had this big blow up. I think it was one of his set pieces. A big blow up cosmic looking uh, spaceship. Yeah. Right. Do, yeah. do you remember that? Yeah. Okay. And then for Leroy's, uh, Leroy's. Uh, back set, he had these antique window frames that were just, you know, really cool, different shapes, all that, that hung out in space. And they had these little wood eyes on them and, and, and they went up to some tracking. And so since this was like multiple acts, complete to look like a complete different place, we were over in Richmond, Virginia, um, the, the uh, set guys would take these windows and would work them into spot and get them just so, well, I'm a dingleberry. I'm just walking around playing my guitar, not thinking, you know, I've still got several acts to go before we, we're on there. And I'm sitting here playing and the good and the bad news was it was an antique window frame, meaning that yeah. it didn't have safety glass. It was old lead pane glass, but this is maybe 30 feet up. Boom, it breaks loose. It comes down and that thing frames me. Pow hit me right on the top of the head and broke the, took the, the bender lever off of the guitar. I just, I didn't have this one on, and I was, Marty, or somebody was standing close to me. I, before I went out, I just had this much time to hand the guitar off yeah. to a guy, and I went down. Luckily, I had the good loosed up mullet hair for a little bit of thing, but James Pennybaker saw yeah. it happen. This is back when they still had, had uh, wall phones. Went over and called Glazer and said, man, I hate to tell you, but I just saw Jimmy Olander get killed. Yeah. <laughs> I was already dead in Nashville. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. I just saw, saw Jimmy O die. Yeah. yeah, took him out. Yeah. yeah. Leroy Parnell set piece just took him out. And yeah. He, anyway, uh, yeah, and it, it, messed, it messed me up a little bit. Uh, um, but anyway, this, the guitar saved, you know, put it back together and, yeah. and saved it. It's been through s several different things for sure. So. It seems like this one kind of became more of your favorite. Was it, um, Absolutely more yeah. of my favorite. Yeah. 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 Why over the Taxicaster? It's, well, um, I think the fact that it's, it's it, we, we, we spoke a little bit about, about style yeah. and about recognizability. And I, you know, probably maybe overdid it with the caricature, but it's got one pickup. Yeah. It's, you know, it's so, I, so along with me becoming, you know, kind of a, a one trick pony, it's a good trick, but it's, you know, it helped that. Yeah. I always knew, well, if I plug that guitar in, it's got one pickup, I'm gonna have to figure out what I'm gonna say, how I'm gonna say it, what the part's gonna be, and it's gonna sound similar to the other stuff. And so there's a the bit of that, it's resonant, meaning that acoustically sitting around in the dressing room, sitting on the bus, it plays and sounds somewhat acoustic. Yeah. Yeah. It's so a great, it's a great guitar. Yeah. In my it, humble opinion. And, yeah. and 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 some of my other tellies and some of my others, they're also really really good guitars. But this one just speaks to me. Yeah. I like how it feels and stuff. Yeah. So, again, just for those that don't know, of course, it's double bender. You know, when you push down, you've got the G. When you pull out, you've got the you've got the the B bender. Okay. So so say that again. When you push down. When you push down. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. Wait a minute. Wait. A minute. Yes. And what's the other one, Zach? <laughs> and when you push out. Yeah. <laughs> yes. That's what that does. Sure. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. So, would you uh, would you humor us by playing some some diamond reel like intros and things like uh, like meet in the middle. Meet in the middle. Humor me. Okay. All right. If I yeah, watch. It. I had a little bit of an accident yesterday, so we'll see. Yes. We'll see how this goes. Um, and you know, you can actually do this this riff without the benders. Yeah. For the most part, there's a couple of things. 
That one would be in incredibly difficult, that position, which is yeah. like your classic D position with the sus yeah. and the bender down. <laughs> Okay, so on this particular intro, what yeah. we've got going on is I'm ghosting some of the low stuff because another thing with, with taking, taking the banjo stylings to guitar was um, a lot of my stuff, if I can implement open strings, I will do that because it really forgives a lot of technique. Okay, because when you've got things ran, ringing, it's, it sounds better, okay? Absolutely. So on this one, I'm coming way up here, and some some a bit a bit that you know it doesn't sound as good. It sounds a little bit beefier up yeah. here, so I'm way up at the, up the neck using the using a quick down and off kind of a spank on the. And up here, I'm coming to a unison. What these should be unison if I'm in tune. Uh, so I've got the open strings and the bender. Everything's still ringing. And I've got to hit this open string here and hit have the B, uh, G lever already engaged and then do a little pull off, which you know has a fun sound to me. Yeah. And then you know as as it's a theme, I somewhat repeat it the na next time with a with a little out for that. Yeah. So. Yeah. So and. Yeah, it didn't sound like any, I mean, it was like, as soon as you heard that, it was like, who the hell is that? <laughs> and you know what? It was really, really fun uh, in concert. Yeah. Our first hit. Yeah. You know, our first single. Yeah. And then to be the guy that walks out and goes, oh, yeah. Yeah, because you're- And hear it and get the crowd reaction. I was like, oh, yeah. damn. Because you're, you're kicking off the song all by yourself. That's it. Yeah. yeah. And uh, super cool. Play an, another one of, uh, like, Love a Little Stronger. That, okay. It's kind of a cool uh, rolling kind of. It it does. Okay. So so, on the heels of meet in the middle. Yeah. So um, again, it's so if we're gonna like if we're gonna decode this style, let's say, man, I would like to do that. Again, it's gonna be the same principles. Okay. So yeah. with with uh, meet in the middle, we got all those. We got the bender stuff, and we got yeah. the open strings, right? Okay. So with love a little stronger. And so we've got all that stuff out. So that would be the intro, okay? So I kind of messed it up in there, but, um, but again, I'm up here, banjo area with melodic banjo, somewhere between the fourth fret and the seventh fret or you can go all the way up to nine. And this is because, you know, when, remember when you're learning to tune your guitar, the unisons. Well, okay, I know where that one is. Where's the next scale step? That's, so I'm up here in that kind of area, mm -hmm. okay? And I've got, got a little bit of a chordy arpeggio ringing thing with these open strings, which is the B out. Now here's a here's a cool one that I, I stumbled across it because I'm sl I'm bending a, a D up to an E, but I'm also bending the B up to C sharp. But I went, oh wait a minute, I can grab the the open C sharp or open B to C sharp as the D goes to E, and and that's kind of doing both both of them on a diagonal stuff, which uh, lots of cool diagonal. If you think about guys that don't play with with bender stuff. Some of the cool things they're doing, if you think about your guitar neck, and you got up and down, you got out, well, you're also going to have things that happen diagonally, okay? So if we're in a position, okay, which is yeah. not, which is Contrary going to, motion bends. Yeah, but, if, but yeah. If, you'll, if you'll look, I kind of did one then the other, Yeah. but if I do them at the same time, you know, just go, oh man, that's genius. Well, actually it's ergonomics. If, so if you just think I'm gonna have my guitar, with the B's already down, okay? So that one goes up. I'm gonna take the, take, or the, the G's already down. I'm gonna take the B out. Okay, so actually the guitar neck needs to go diagonally this way. All right? Yeah. And 
So, and if I forget what the, the other examples are, but, but anyway, that's, there's not a whole lot more to it. Yeah. You know? Uh, such, such, such great parts. Um, you've got a, a couple things on the guitar that I just, I just noticed. One, you've got a different kind of nut on there where it's, it's uh, I guess, to help with the intonation. It's got a, yes. a, a, little, a little part that's kind of added on, to, on, the, on the G string. So and then and then you've got that uh, Glazer's making that uh, three string uh, str uh, string tree yeah. that, that really helps with the with the G string uh, kind of uh, noting properly yeah, when so it's if open. You can, if you can if you can look at this, I don't know where your camera angle is, but I used to have on the on the G string when I'd put a G string on, it used to be uh, wraps all the way to the peg head to right. get to increase the neck or increase the, the down angle yes. to put pressure on the nut. Yes. Or so it wouldn't sound weaker or maybe a little bit buzzy or just kind of wasn't really true. Yeah, or it would ping and also and have like a little reverb effect at times. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so, um, and with all those winds, the stretch out period, and now I'm constantly bending that string. And there's all these winds that are incorporated and going up and going down and going up and going down. Yeah. And so this uh, triple string tree gets that G in there. And on some other guitars, I've got two string trees. Yeah. Just to go, and it'll be the first two and then maybe the second two. Um, but that just, what, what a simple and ingenious thing to help us all out by just sticking another thing on there. Yeah. The, uh, the compensated nut is something that we're going from wound strings to the to the to the unwound third. For some reason, I would invariably temper tune the guitar to where when I played my A, it would be in tune, and the G would be a little bit flat. Right. Okay. So to to compensate for that, if you take the distance between the first fret and the second fret, and then tune that to standard pitch, it's going it, to it, essentially take the, all these frets on the third string, it's gonna move them down a little bit. Now the effect goes away as you go up the neck. And this is, uh, this is something, I don't know, Joe did this for me and I don't know if there's a placebo effect or not, but I really think that this works. Um, and it works on an individual basis for the player that's doing this. Yeah. So when you get this done, you need to be in the shop while this is happening and they start adding because they want to add just the minimum of that because, you know, man, they can get this stuff to really, really get nuts on, but then it's uh, get nuts on here and here, but then the, you can never play the first fret. Right. Because it's always really flat. Yeah. So it's kind of, I've got some acoustic guitars. You can see the Grevin up here. Yeah. It's got fifth and sixth because I like to play in drop D. So when I play the G string here at the fifth fret, it's not flat. Right. And this, and I've got a Collings over there. It's got some, uh, and man, those are just the little intonation kind of things that are squirrely. Yeah, yeah. So you uh, you made the the first record with all these kind of esoteric uh, t old tube gear that you were you know plugging into, and then of course you've got to go out on the road and reproduce those sounds. So what did you use live? You know, like on that on that first tour. <clears throat> I think early on I was using well, always stereo, and I was using. I had one of the little Mark Sampson era matchlesses, and I remember finding it in a music store up in like Canton, Michigan, or something. I was visiting my folks yeah. when they're living around the Detroit area. I'd never heard of this amp amplifier before, and I had my guitar, and and I had a I had a, a writing deal with Warner Chapel, and um, it was a modest deal. I think they were paying me fifteen grand a year. And usually, you know, they divvy these out in weekly in installments. And I said, I tell you what, because we were having hits and I didn't, you know, I wanted them to buy in on this and hey, it's felt like free money. So I said, but I want it in one check. And that was my gear and mad money fund. Yeah. Okay, so this was an end of the year doing tax deduction. And I'm on there and I play through this matchless amplifier and I was just like, oh my gosh, it's just incredible. So I think I had the matchless and the pro. And the pro just couldn't quite keep up with the matchless. So I ended up going with another combo and had two of those matchlesses. Now it's, I just bungled my way into finding a really cool amp that all of a sudden people really liked. But it had, you know, it had a good sound and, and stuff like that. And I played those matchless things 
for years. Usually under the stage, we were, we were some of the early proponent, proponents of in-air monitors. Yeah. They were just coming around. Future, Future Sonics was the company that we can go. I can remember because, you know, it's our first deal. We did one of our first shows as Diamond Rio with a hit. I think it was like Montgomery, Alabama at the, at the whatever their legislative building. And we, we, Pam Tillis was on the show. That was another one of the, the, the acts that was signed to Arista. Pam's great. Yeah. She gets out there and kills it. And the transition from the small stage to the big stage for us was horrible. Because, man, cranking up the amps and Gene had his, his vocal and his mandolin screaming so loud that I would turn up and I was trying, you know, I actually had a volume control myself. I could turn it up, turn it down. And, and I was trying to be respectful. And then there was this and this is, and Marty had horrific intonation problems. And it was just absolutely horrible. We just got done with this, watching this great act. And we got up there and just stunk it up. We did this with Wild Rose one time too. Wow. And we went, okay. That was horrible. This show was horrible. We were about to be done. I'm pretty convinced. I mean, it was, I don't know if you've heard yeah. stuff this bad. It no. was really bad. So, but, 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 but and going so we, to in-ears. Yeah, yeah, but we went to in-ears and that made the amps go away. Yeah. Okay, so they were off stage. they were backstage. I was, and I, I don't think a lot of guys were doing that because I was immediately one of the most unpopular guitar players with the little Nashville Opry and yeah. with all these places that all of a sudden their green room has these screaming electric. You know, they weren't that loud, but when nothing else is back there and you got two of them going, yeah. it seems really loud. Yeah. So you got into the matchless thing. Eventually you were using uh, two of them together. I, di I did. And, and so, um, so I talked to, talk to you about my Warner Chapel, yeah. Chapel draw. Um, I went through different incarnations. So I was playing the matchless stuff out on the road, but so we went through all this crazy tube gear, uh, vintage tube gear. And then the next time I, I completely got a complete new recording rig to do the next record. And I can't remember what the preamp was. I can't remember the configuration and we made, made the next record. The next record, oh, it's a new record. Okay, I have all new stuff. You know, I'm still over there with Wise over Warners for 20, 25 years, something like that. So I was still getting that draw, went out and bought an, the next rig. Okay, so first album direct, next one maybe direct, maybe there's, there's some amps going, maybe I'm putting the matchless on here. But you know what? Yeah, it sounded a little bit different. But every time I would completely retool, I would try to dial in the same sound on yeah. everything. And it was a, and it was a really, good learning thing for me about the guitar and the hands and, and stuff like that. And the fact that I, my instincts are to go for this thing, whatever I'm plugged into, you know? And it doesn't, it's, it sounds better or worse, but I'm, for some reason, those are the knobs that I, you know, I'm gonna find it somewhere. Yeah. The best version of that I can find. You're gonna get I've a sound to. that you're comfortable with whatever gear you're using. And, yeah. and there's, there's kind of this, and then it doesn't matter what gear you use, you're kind of going for the same sound. Uh, and I didn't know that. Yeah. But you know what I mean? I need all new gear. All oh, this supposed to, this stuff's supposed to be great. Let's see if I can make it sound like me. Yeah. Like you know. Yeah. Just a lot more expensive version than what I just was using. You know. And so anyway, I kind of got out of doing a lot of gear switches and yeah. stuff like that. I kind of hit a plateau and I recorded a bunch of stuff with the Matchless and then um, started pro tooling. I did quite a few records with. Um, in the box plugins, yeah. you know, I learned how to make those sound pretty good, you know, um, and and that was just it was nice working at home, you know, um, and then I played the matchless stuff and we were, we recorded those the matchless stuff there for a long time and then uh, uh, I got into doing some other guitars on the road and I think. I talked to Tom Hemby, um, and he had told me about the Kemper. Yeah, you know, and um, I think I was one of the earlier guys in town. Not as early as Tom. Tom had. Yeah, he was early, oh, an early adopter of. Well, it was, yeah. and not. It was so early that his 
his Kemper had you couldn't do a firmware update on it. It was that's that was yeah. what that one was going. To, if you're yes. going to want to grow with Kemper, you got to get rid of that one. Yeah, you know, to go on with it. And when I got into that, that was that was fun. You know, yeah. And playing 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 this, listening to this amp today. I mean, that sounds great. Yeah. You know, all the stuff just sounds good. It just sounds good. Yeah. But there's all sorts of different tools. And so now you use the Kemper live most of the time. I use the Kemper live. And, yeah. uh, and what has been super, super cool about this is I play acoustic guitar live and I play banjo live. And um, the preamps that are, are since, since the, uh, a Kemper profiling amplifier is not a guitar amp, it's a profiling amplifier. Yeah. Um, and so if you profile bad gear in a bad way, you can sound bad all the time if you want to. Yeah. Right? <laughs> yes, if you want that. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Or if you, want, if you get something good, and Michael Britt has spent a bunch of time with me, and... Uh, been very generous with his time and his profiles and have got me, like when I first, when I first got the Kemper, I was trying to talk myself into liking it. It's like, oh yeah. Because even at our artist pricing, it was expensive. Yeah. And I was like, yeah, I like it. Yeah, I like it. You know, because I made that decision. And, uh, but as soon as I got his profiles, I was like, oh, this is actually cool. Yeah. You know, and it was, it was significantly different. And then taking it a step further, with the acoustic guitar and the banjo, since it's not a guitar amplifier, it's a profiling amplifier, well, you can go find preamps or profile rack gear. So I played the, the callings through an API for a long time, and I forget what I was playing through the banjo through, but all technology stuff, and every time I plug those acoustic instruments, they sound more acoustic than they do. One thing about piezos is the sound is so immediate that it's, I can't play in a neutral dynamic, okay, with piezos. I either have to be really, really light and airy on acoustic, or I have to dig in very hard, but not quack hard. Yeah. But the, mid, the middle range of dynamics with, with that stuff is so immediate that I even think about playing the song, it's in my ear, and you know, with in-ears, it's so in my face. So the Kemper and running through some of the electronics puts a little bit more, it's possibly just just uh, a millisecond or maybe less, maybe it's samples or something like that, but but makes it sound a little bit more like an acoustic guitar that the sound develops and hits your ear. Um, and Justin Weaver and David Spires came over when, you know, the banjo sounded pretty good, but they came over with a tone dexter. Have you used a tone dexter? I haven't, but I know what it is. Yeah. Okay, so they came over with a tone dexter and they had figured out, what were they using? They were on the Josh Turner gig together and they were using Helix, or but the little stomp Helixes. Yeah, yeah. And they were in bed with Tone Dexter and with, when these guys were using multiple instruments, they had to have multiple Tone Dexters for each instrument. And I think David Spire is kind of a genius guy and he, he went, you know what? We can make these profiles in the Tone Dexter and then I can he figured out how to convert the files into a Helix file. And dump it they, in there. And dumped it in the Helix. So now they have just this one little thing that has, so when they pick up their mandolins or dobros or banjos and stuff, they've got the Tone Dexter file that's been made for that. And it sounds like that. And they came over there and they didn't know if they're going to be able to do this, but you know, he had a sneaky suspicion or he wouldn't have showed up with the Tone Dexter. Yeah. And we did the banjo that way. And, you know, I've told you my affection for banjo, my experience for banjo, and it, it's just completely changed my world as far as what that sounds like. Yeah, and, Through, being, and being able to do that live. And in, well, it's all about being done. Yeah. I would never yeah. play yeah. an instrument that should be mic'd. Yeah. You know, through a pickup. Yeah. Unless, you know, unless there was something weird effect, you know, like the, the piezos on the Parker or something like that. You're wanting to do some big delay, yeah. you know, nightmare or something like that, so... Yeah. yeah, that's it, baby. Yeah, <laughs> and it works. And it works, yes, it works yeah. very well. Picks. Picks. Picks, acrylics, Yeah. and blue chip. And what kind of strings? Well, we're GHS guys. Nice. So 
Um, usually GHS, this is, a, this is a set of Diodario, of the new Diodario NYX. Yeah, NYXL. That's, NYXL. Yeah. Um, this is my first set on here. They're really nice. Yeah, like um, 10 through 46? Or? Oh yeah, 10 through 46. Yeah. I did 11 through 52 for a little while. Yeah. Never really did the hybrid stuff. Um, I can't tolerate anything lighter. Yeah. You know, just from heavy hands and bluegrass and stuff like that. But 10, 10 through 46 is a, is, a, is a really good, I mean, it's, you know, it's a standard gauge, right? Yeah. It's the most average of all, I would say. And, and, it, and it's good. Well, Jimmy, thank you so much for uh, let, letting us come out and uh, telling your story and, and showing us your gear. And uh, it, was, it was wonderful. Thank oh, good. You. Well, thank you, Zach. Yeah. We'll do it in 30 years. In 30 years, we'll do it again. <laughs>